Welcome, 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 everyone. I'm your host, Michael Lofton, Reason and Theology, Saturday evening. Doing a stream here on Papal Infallibility. By the way, I see you in the uh, chat there, Kyle. How are you? Yeah, doing a stream here on Papal Infallibility um, involving John the 22nd and issues surrounding him on the topic. And I think it's worth noting because mm, few people have brought it up uh, as an objection to papal infallibility. Uh, I mentioned it the other day. Um, Michael Welton, who is Catholic, who went Orthodox, mentions it in his book, Two Paths, tries to use this as an argument for or against uh, papal infallibility and maintains that John the 22nd uh, rejected papal infallibility in Quium Corundum Mentis uh, in 1324, which we're going to take a look at in a minute. And he did a really shoddy job with it. I mean, just a really superficial, cursory um, review of it and didn't really engage it very well. Um, and I'm also going to show a Protestant who kind of does the same thing, although he dives in just a little bit more. But then you have guys like Brian Tierney, right? Brian Tierney uh, is a scholar who I believe he's Catholic, but I'd question, <laughs> I'd question that, um, <clears throat> who seems to take that, seems to take the same position that these others take, um, that he was arguing against papal infallibility. But I have not... Uh, I've read a little of his work. I haven't read the whole thing, so I might be misunderstanding him there. So please don't hold me to that. If he comes out, I mean, and says in the origins of papal infallibility, which is his main work on it, if he ends up saying, okay, no, uh, John the 22nd didn't deny papal infallibility. Okay, great. Wonderful. Again, no sweat off my back either way. Uh, but that's the impression I get. And guys like uh, Heft, who responded to him uh, seemed to take a different view. And I'm going to review a doctoral thesis here by uh, John Cruz. This was his doctoral thesis um, on reevaluating the origins of papal infallibility. And so we're going to go through his doctoral dissertation, a few segments of it where he's going to explain it. First of all, we're going to go through that Protestants objections to just kind of set the stage and then we're going to go to the response uh by dr cruz and i believe heft was also a reader for this dissertation i'm pretty sure i'd have to look at the beginning of the dissertation again but i think he was a reader for it uh but it's good stuff really good stuff and then i'm going to go over dr joy's dissertation not dr joy why am i saying dr joy dr king in his dissertation, where in the beginning, in just kind of some introductory remarks, he addresses papal infallibility and he dives into the issue of uh, quia corundum mentis a little bit and has some really interesting points that he brings up and he cites uh, Heft's work in his translation. Um, the problem is I don't have access to Hef's work right now in front of me, so I'm just going to use Joy as a secondary source, if you will. <laughs> uh, not Joy. Why do I keep saying Joy? Uh, Dr. King is a secondary source. So uh, we'll go over a couple dissertations that engage this, and I think they give a really good uh, apologetic that explain that John the 22nd is not denying papal infallibility, and um, in fact, he argued otherwise. So that's kind of where we're going today. Uh, let me share my screen. Oh, and by the way, I think y'all are asking about um, the comedy hour. Yeah, yeah, we, we did it live, but I mean, I have it for, for patrons only now. So y'all got to you gotta become a patron to watch it. Uh, what it is, is right now um, with some of these streams, I'm doing them live so I can get uh, audience participation, but then afterwards, um, and, and this isn't the case for all videos. It's just for for a few. Afterwards, I'll I'll make it available only for patrons. So, um, but I, I do like having it live initially open to everyone, so that 
we can have some interaction at the end with questions and answers. Um, but then I want to make it available to patrons only as well, because I want to make some content that's unique uh, for the patrons. So if y'all want to check it out, uh, we did a comedy hour earlier. It was really interesting. Uh, Pastor Steven Anderson, Todd Friel. Uh, you got to check it out. It was, uh, it was definitely noteworthy. So, all right, <laughs> let's, uh, let's talk about this here. Uh, pull up my screen. Y'all should be able to see that. Uh, let me zoom in on this because that's really small. This is coming from Deus Ex Machina uh, blog. I believe he's a Protestant. I don't know that for sure, but just kind of sk skimming through his blog, it appears he's a Protestant, but don't quote me on that. Uh, he does a very cursory view of this issue and you know it's he does better than most I'll, I'll grant him that um but i think he makes some fundamental mistakes towards the end especially and i'm gonna you know address both of them and show what they are he summarizes what's going on here. And he, before I even read his little summary, let me just read you the relevant text. I mean, there's there's a whole lot in the um in the document from John the 22nd. Uh is it a bull or is it a apostolic constitution? I don't remember. Yeah, it's a bull. Um <clears throat> this is the the money quote, if you will, the relevant text. Uh, and of course, just again, to set the stage, what John the 22nd is doing is he's responding to the spiritual Franciscans who are saying that Nicholas the third, um, they're claiming that Nicholas the third basically said that their rule of life on poverty is perfectly the rule of life that Jesus practiced. Um, so that they and they alone have a monopoly here on, uh, the way of life of Jesus and his poverty. And that it is irreformable. Peter Olivi, uh, took that position that, um, the Pope here, when he made this decision, it's irreformable. It cannot be undone. So he made that, that claim of papal infallibility being employed here. Um, and who, I'm trying to see, I'm looking at the chat there, um, saying something about Peter Diamond. Let, let me know if y'all see one of the Diamond brothers so I can kick them out of the chat because uh, I don't have any more patience for them. So if y'all spot one of them, let me know. Um, <laughs> anyways, so again, he's dealing with uh, this claim that, you know, Nicholas the Third defined the Franciscan rule on poverty irreformably and John, the 22nd who had overturned it, according to them, overturned it can't do that because he's bound to what Nicholas um, had definitively decided on this matter. So what he's doing here, John, the 22nd is he's trying to respond to that saying, no, that's not necessarily the case. Now, he's not denying papal infallibility per se, but what he's doing is kind of two things. Number one, he's refuting an understanding of Franciscan or a Franciscan understanding of papal infallibility. He's refuting that. It's not refuting papal infallibility in and of itself, though, because uh, he goes on to especially confirm that he wasn't doing that later on. Um, and then he is um, basically explaining that the uh, reforms, if you will, that he have made really aren't overturning anything that Nicholas III had decided. So he, he's actually not contradicting Nicholas III. And in fact, Nicholas III had said in Exit, I believe was the bull, um, that for a proper interpretation of this, it would have to be brought to the apostolic seed. Apostolic C would have to be able to properly interpret what the bull means, uh, which is exactly what John the 22nd is doing. In other words, they're wrong to number one, say that 
John the 22nd was overturning Nick Pope Nicholas. And then two, their understanding of irreformability was incorrect. Not that it's incorrect overall. Like, in other words, that there's no kind of papal uh, infallibility, but that their understanding of it was false. That's what's effectively going on here. But here's the money quote that people like to latch on to and, and say, oh, wow, this is a refutation to uh, papal infallibility. Vatican I refuted. Here you go. To attack the before-mentioned constitutions, it is reported that they have used publicly in word and in writing the following argument. They say that whatever through the key of knowledge, key word, but intended. The Roman pontiffs have once defined in faith and morals persists so immutably that it is not licit for a successor to call it again into doubt, nor affirm the contrary, though they say it is otherwise with the things ordained through the key of power. And he goes on to say, this is false. In other words, it really sounds like Vatican would destroy bill and you know all that kind of stuff that you encounter from the online people right um that's what people like to do with this but they don't dig deeper and they don't try to find out let's let me really try to understand what's going on here and i guarantee you if you ask them do you even know what that means the key of knowledge nope they don't know what that means <laughs> they, they don't understand what he means by that so uh, that's kind of what we're going to do here. Now, I want to go to this Protestant, presumably he's Protestant, his interpretation of this. I'm not saying I agree with it. I'm just showing you here, setting the stage so that you can see I'm not making this up. There are really people out there that maintain that this is a good proof text against papal infallibility. So he summarizes, there's a spiritual key which the Pope possesses. And by virtue of the promises given to Peter is a key of power to bind and loose, to excommunicate, basically. However, the spiritual key, the key of power, is distinct from a key of knowledge, which is the authority to examine, to examine a situation. Um, and he says, you should come more polemic, which would make a good watch. <laughs> <laughs> people already are upset by they, they feel that I'm already too polemical. They feel that I'm already mean. And uh, not everybody does, by the way. I'm just saying some people feel that I'm mean and that I'm rude and that I laugh at people. Uh, so they already feel I'm, I'm too polemical. So, all right. Uh, which is the authority to examine. The key of knowledge, however, is not sufficient in, 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 in itself to be able to define anything. Again, this is the summary that this Protestant is giving. The only way in which he can be enacted is with both keys of knowledge and of power. For only uh, Through only, the key of power has the power to enact, define, but the key of knowledge is necessary as well as a physical light is necessary to guide a key bearer. And how to use the key, likewise, is knowledge necessary to guide the Pope in his use of spiritual keys? And then the final part. However, Matthew 16, 19 deliberately omits, uh, omits mention of the key of knowledge and explicitly only identifies the key of power to bind the loose when speaking of the key given to Peter. So effectively, let me summarize that. What he's saying is this. He's saying that, well, John the 22nd is saying, look, there's two keys out there. The Key of knowledge, which is the key to examine things on faith and morals, and the key of power, which is the key to bind and loose, to definitively settle an issue. And you have to have both if you're going to infallibly define something, because just like if you're going to use a key, you have to have light. Well, you have to have then the key of knowledge, being the light, in order to turn the key of power being the authority to definitively de determine something, infallibly de de determine something. Um, you have to have both for a pope to be infallible. But Matthew 16 doesn't say that the pope was given the key of knowledge. He was only given the key of power. Therefore, the Protestant, Protestant is claiming that um, John the 22nd is saying, 
he he's not infallible and the pope can't infallibly define something because he doesn't possess the key of knowledge that's the protestant spin on this i'm not saying it's right i'm saying that's the protestant spin on the text i don't think it's a very good one so he goes here conclusion uh the key given to Peter by Christ is merely the key of power, not the key of knowledge. As such, the Pope does not possess the power to immutably define anything because he simply does not possess the key of knowledge, which is the necessary component to be able to define anything. False. He doesn't say the Pope doesn't have the key of knowledge. He, he does not say that. John the 22nd does not say that. What he's saying is it's not explicit in Matthew 16. But what is, is explicit is the key of power. He's saying the key of knowledge is not explicit. That doesn't mean that it's not there. He does believe it's there. He believes it is implied in the giving of the key of power. You see that? You see the nuance? One is reading too much into the Pope here and assuming too much. And again, I'm going to go to this dissertation to show it. Uh, but there you go. There's the Protestant spin on it. And then later on, uh, which I'm going to address as well, the same individual claims that the Pope was teaching Sola Scriptura. Where, where is my, hold on, where's my sound effects for laughter? I, I know my, I have one right here. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> I need to start playing the laughter every time I hear something silly. We're, we're going to just start playing that one right there. All right. So John the 22nd taught Sola Scriptura, everyone. Inquia <laughs> Corundum Mentis. He taught Sola Scriptura, bro. Um, did he really? No. No, he, he doesn't. Uh, I'll go ahead and knock that one out real quick. Um, what he's basically doing is saying, look, um, things that are going to be irreformable have to be based on Scripture, right? Because the Pope can't just make something up out of nowhere, new revelation. That's what he's saying. He's saying the Pope doesn't have the authority to infallibly determine something out of nowhere. Out of nowhere. Now, that shouldn't be controversial. Now, that, that will be controversial to an ignorant Protestant who thinks that we're saying that popes can literally make up doctrines and add new revelation. That might come as a surprise to ignorance, uh, ignorant people. But for those of us who actually know better and have read Vatican I, uh, we, we know, okay, yeah, no, that's not the case. That's, that's silly. So... <clears throat> um. Somebody saying I need Mother Angelica's laugh on the soundboard. <laughs> yeah, I, I think we should have added this one to Comedy Hour, right? <laughs> uh, but, you know, back, back to the issue here. He, what he's saying is that it has to be, if he's going to define something that's on a matter of faith and morals, it has to be in Scripture. Is that Sola Scriptura? No, not at all. That's not Sola Scriptura. I affirm that proposition. If a Pope's going to be defining something, it has to be in Scripture in some way, implicitly or explicitly. That's just called material sufficiency, which Catholics can maintain. I know it hasn't been definitively settled, the debate on formal and material sufficiency, but I think that the weight goes to the formal uh, i'm sorry material sufficiency position i don't have a problem with saying that all he's saying is look uh if you're going to define something on faith and morals it has to be rooted in the the deposit of faith uh yeah and so his argument is he nowhere jesus nowhere authenticates the franciscan way of life as the ultimate way of life on poverty the franciscan um, position alone on it at least 
Therefore, it can't be, it wasn't uh, settled definitively by Nicholas. That's effectively his argument. So uh, let's move on. Let's go to the dissertation. Enough for setting the stage there. Let's go to the response. And this is information you probably won't hear every day and probably will have to do a lot of digging for, but you won't have to since y'all are watching Reason and Theology. So uh, you're welcome. <laughs> I did the research and um, made this available. This is the kind of stuff that you generally aren't going to hear very often, but it is a legitimate response, in my opinion, to the problem that we see with somebody who raises quia corundum as a refutation to papal infallibility. All right, here we go. John the 23rd, I'm sorry, um, <clears throat> he said 23rd here. Uh, I think he meant 22nd. I, I, I read 23rd and I'm looking at it. It actually says 23rd. Yeah, okay, it's just a typo. It's not John 23rd. Uh, John the 22nd, we'll correct that typo, begins quia corundum mentis by stating that he writes this decree to prevent the errors of those attacking ad conditorum conditorum and cum inter non nullus. Uh, which was another bull that he had previously written overturning exceed, uh, I guess is how you pronounce it by uh, Pope Nicholas. So, and that's, that's what stirred this, you know, brought up this controversy from spreading to others. John also draws attention to extensive counsel. He sought in writing both those earlier bulls and this current bull. In Quia Corundum Mentis, John the 22nd focuses his attention on refuting the arguments of his opponents as found in the excursus of the Sockenhausen, uh, uh, I guess that's how you pronounce that, Apollatio. He, he tackles first the argument that what a pope determines using the key of knowledge, here we go, is irrevocable. So they're claiming that if you use the key of knowledge, it's irrevo irrevocable. And somebody's asking, is this my dissertation? No, 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 no. This, this isn't mine. This is um, Dr. John Cruz's dissertation. But I'm, I'm reading it for mine, right? It's relevant to mine, so that's why I'm reading these dissertations. All right. John notes that in this text, his opponents distinguish between papal decrees made using the key of knowledge and those decrees made use the, using the key of power. So this is what the opponents are arguing. According to John's opponents, what his predecessors defined through the key of knowledge and faith and morals was unchangeable. So again, they're claiming if the key of knowledge is used, it's irreformable. John states, they claim that what the Roman pontiffs defined once through the key of knowledge and faith and morals remains so unchangeable that it is not permitted to a successor either to call it into doubt or to confirm the contrary, even though they assert that it is otherwise with respect to the things which the Roman pontiffs had ordered uh, through the key of power. So that's the quote that we had just you know, looked at, the money quote. John's opponents held that because John's predecessors had used the key of knowledge to determine that the friars imitated Christ and the apostles by owing nothing and by having only the simple use of fact, John was not able to alter those rulings. So uh, Pope Nicholas's uh, ruling could not be overturned by John, so they were objecting to him. Uh, yet, according to his opponents, this is just what John had done in cum inter non nolos, right? For his part, John denies the distinction between a key of knowledge and power. First of all, listen to that. Pay attention to that. His opponents, the spiritual Franciscans, they're the ones saying there's a distinction between the key of knowledge and the key of power. They're the ones saying that, not him. He believes that really one assumes the other. So since Jesus gave Peter the key of power, he's given him also the key of knowledge. It's just not explicitly mentioned there. That's what he is maintaining. So notice this nuance here. 
Uh, so for his part, he denies that there's a difference between the key of knowledge and the key of power. For according to John, the key of knowledge is not a key explicitly mentioned by Christ in the conferral of keys to Peter, but is an implied key that is to serve as a light in exercising the key of power, which even the Protestant himself had noted that. He, he just didn't really put it together. In short, John argues that popes do not issue unchangeable decrees using a key of knowledge. Rather, a key of knowledge guides popes in exercising the key of power. So the proposition that he condemned was that, again, go back to it, the quote right here. What the Roman pontiffs once defined through the key of knowledge of faith and morals remains so unchangeable that it's not permitted to a successor to call it into doubt, even though they assert that it is otherwise with respect to the key of power. So he's refuting the proposition that key of knowledge, irreformable. Key of power, eh, eh, you know, that can change up for grabs. That That's effectively what he's refuting he's saying no 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 first of all there's no fundamental difference because one assumes the other i mean you can make a distinction but one assumes the other so there's no separate giving of the keys and it's not that one is irreformable and the other one isn't that is what he is refuting and then he goes on to even say that even if this were the case guess what i did not reverse Pope Nicholas's teachings, and he goes to prove that. That's what he's doing. You see that? You see how it's so easy to just pull that quote just by itself, paste it into a, a book like Michael Welton did, or an article like this guy did, Deus Ex Machina, whoever the author is, and just say, ah, see, right there, there you go. Papal infallibility refuted, bro. Vatican I destroyed. Anytime you see a video on YouTube with the words destroyed in it or refuted in it, uh, don't waste your time. <laughs> don't waste your time. It's usually going to be by somebody who fails to uh, make distinctions. And uh, just isn't able to make nuances, isn't able to um, discern nuances. Let's read a little bit more, even though I've, I think I've uh, pretty much established the point. Let's look a little bit more. Having attempted to undermine his opponent's claims that popes issue unchangeable decrees through the key of knowledge, John the 22nd turns to demonstrate how his opponents misinterpreted the decrees of his predecessors. First of all, John states that his opponents claimed that the decrees of Honorius, Gregory, Innocent, Alexander, and Nicholas had declared that the friars practiced the most perfect form of evangelical life by having only the bare use of fact. John can easily deal with the bulls of Honorius, Gregory, Innocent, and Alexander. John rightly states that these predecessors had said no such thing regarding simple use of facts. Rather, according to John, the use of things permitted to the friars by his predecessors naturally implied a, a right of use. Furthermore, John points out that Gregory and Alexander had argued that both the friars minor and wait for it, drum roll, everyone. Hold on, let me pull up the drum roll. I, I, I think I have a drum roll in here, don't I? Let, let's... Let's find out. No, that, <laughs> that definitely is not a drum roll. I don't know. Maybe I, I don't have one. I thought one came in on here by default. We'll, we'll leave it there. Drum roll, y'all. And the order of preachers. That's the Dominicans, right? The order of preachers shared in the highest poverty. Notice what he's saying. Not only did they say the friar minors shared in the highest poverty, but also the order of preachers. So you can't single out the Franciscans as them alone having a monopoly on Jesus's poverty and way of living. 
because guess what? The order of preachers have possessions, right? Clearly, the order of preachers shared in things in common, shared things in common, and thus evangelical profession perfection does not consist in renunciation of communal ownership. Franciscan poverty destroyed. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, on a serious note, let's, let's continue. John the 22nd cannot so easily argue from Nicholas's exit, uh, in which Nicholas stated that the, uh, friars who followed Christ had only a simple use of fact. John correctly points out that Nicholas never explicitly said that Christ and the apostles had only a simple use of fact. John also argues that Nicholas seems to have thought that Christ and the apostles had some things in common. Hmm. More importantly, John argues that if, by simple use of fact, Nicholas meant that the right of use was excluded, Nicholas himself contradicted Gregory, Innocent, and Alexander, who had stated that the friars had the use of goods, a use which implied a, a right of use. So that would be a contradiction then, right? So Nicholas then would be wrong. <laughs> so they can't appeal to Nicholas like they were doing. Um, now, <clears throat> yeah, somebody saying, well, now you can't take me seriously because I said destroyed. That's right. <laughs> uh, where was I at here? Cause I don't have my little cursor. Uh, more importantly, John argues that if by simple use of fact, Nicholas meant that the right of use was excluded. Nicholas himself contradicted Gregory, innocent and Alexander, who had stated that the friars had the use of goods, a use, which implied a use, uh, a right of use. Furthermore. John goes on to remind the reader that he has already shown that it is impossible to have simple use of fact without, without right to use, especially as regards to consumables. He further stresses that use without right is clearly unjust and cannot in any way pertain to perfection. Certainly, according to John, this could not have been Nicholas's intention. John asserts that Nicholas himself demonstrated that he believed that the friars had the right to use some things and that he accepted dominion of the things the brothers could use in moderation while pointing out that they were not permitted to use all things. Obviously, according to John, Nicholas believed that the friars had the right to use some things and not others. Having attempted to demonstrate how his opponents distorted the correct interpretation of his predecessors, John the 22nd turns to tackle the issue of whether a pontiff has the right to change the decree of a predecessor. John first seeks to use historical arguments to demonstrate that pontiffs do have such a right. And so arguing, John again points out that his opponents have mis misinterpreted what his pre predecessors have ruled. John goes on to argue that if his opponents wish to argue that he does not have the right to change what Nicholas III decreed, the same should be said about Nicholas to alter the decree of his predecessors. That is exactly what Nicholas did, according to John if it is accepted that he denied that the friars had the right of use. Furthermore, John quite rightly points out that Nicholas himself declared that any future questions regarding the correct interpretation of exit were to be brought to the Holy See, which is exactly what was happening here. And John the 22nd was responsible for the Holy See, right? According to John, this very practice of bringing questions regarding the correct interpretation to the Pope uh, was what was being attacked by his opponents. John goes on to argue historically that the fact that various popes have contradicted each other regarding the prohibition of the foundation of new religious orders since Lateran IV demonstrates that pontiffs have the right to change the decrees of their predecessors. Well, that's not meaning that Okay, he he can change everything, right? He, that that's not what he's saying. He's talking about discipline because John the twenty second believed what Nicholas was ruling on was discipline and not faith and morals, and you know that because of the end where he appeals to scripture. That's his appealing to show, hey, this isn't a matter of faith and morals because it's not a found in scripture. 
John the 22nd believes that his right to alter Nicholas III's decree can be demonstrated not only historically, but also canonically and theologically. According to John, nowhere in the creeds or in scripture can it be found that Christ and his apostles had only the simple use of fact. Furthermore, to deny that Christ and his apostles had only simple use of fact does not undermine scripture or the articles of faith. Consequently, it is clear the issue at hand is not. One of faith and morals. There you go, y'all. He wasn't even ruling on a matter of faith and morals. So he's saying, I can overturn this. In addition, neither the creeds nor scripture prohibit pontiffs from changing the decrees of their predecessors. John concludes his bull by stating that anyone who asserts that Christ and his apostles had only the simple use of fact of the things which they used should be avoided as a what? A heretic. Wait. Hmm. Heresy involves irreformability, doesn't it? Hmm. It did in his mind, right? It did in his mind. And so if irreformability is at play, what do you have John the 22nd arguing for? Papal infallibility, right? <laughs> Furthermore, anyone who violates cum inter non nolis is to be viewed as a heretic, and anyone who violates ad conditorum uh, canonum uh, is to be viewed as contumacious and a rebel to the church. So, uh, much more can be said. We could read more about it, but I'll I'll leave that so that we're within fair use range here of the dissertation. <laughs> I want to read the whole guy's dissertation here, but shout out to Hill, Doctor, uh, Doctor. Let, let's see, it was John Cruz? Uh, let me go to it here at the top. Uh, shout out to Doctor Cruz for some good material. If y'all want to go and uh, read it, if you have access to it, there you go. Uh, Reevaluating the origins of papal infallibility, understanding papal authority, and the bulls of the Franciscan poverty controversy. Very, very good stuff. Last one here. I'm going to read from Dr. King's uh, dissertation. Uh, yet at no point did John the 22nd deny that a pope could define a doctrine in such a way that it would be binding on his successors. Indeed, when he was later accused by Michael of Cassena of having done so, he assisted, insisted that he had not. And here we have referenced. Um, oh, actually, I'm sorry. I, I, th I thought he was referencing uh, Heft earlier. No, he's actually referencing tyranny origins of papal infallibility. So tyranny even himself notes that um, John the 22nd himself claimed that he wasn't saying that there is no way in which a pope could bind another pope. So he's not saying that a pope could not define a doctrine that would be uh, irreformable. He's not saying that. And that's Tyranny, Origins of Papal Infallibility, page 190. Uh, so there you go. Send me some chat questions if y'all have them. Otherwise, I'll kill the stream here in just a little bit. I didn't realize we've been going 40 minutes. Wow. I felt like maybe 15 or so. Uh, but yeah, good stuff. There you go. Protestantism destroyed. Um, this is th this is what I mean by just dig deeper, right? Don't don't just go with superficial arguments that seem to indicate that there's a contradiction. Dig a little deeper and uh, try to see if there are responses that are available. Uh, let's see what Hugh's asking here. Did you write a summary article on common alleged and genuine papal errors and contradictions if you have time? 
it would be a long time before I can do that. <laughs> it's easier for me to just do these videos, to be honest with you, than sit down and write. That That's why I just, if I want to say something, instead of writing an article these days, I just do a stream on it. It's quicker for me to do that. It takes longer to write an article, for better or worse. So, um, what is this? Uh, it sounds quite sad. Even uh, you say kill the stream, <laughs> like you're choking out the stream. <laughs> You've never heard that term, kill the stream. <laughs> uh yeah have i heard of the ravi uh, zacharias controversy yeah yeah i have didn't they just finally release the final conclusion i saw it earlier today i mean i've i've read previous comments on it but um i didn't read the final report but i saw reports prior to that that already in indicated he was guilty so sad uh, so what are my thoughts? It's sad. I'm sorry for all of the people who were uh, victims to those things. And um, it's, a, it's a good reminder that we should be uh, repenting of our sins. Because he died, basically, having not, um, not revealed that. In fact, he had, uh, he had denied him, if I recall correctly. So he had basically died uh, at least publicly lying about the matter to my recollection correct me if i'm wrong let me know in the chat if, I, if i'm misremembering but i think he he publicly denied those accusations and uh died you know now i don't know if he privately before he died repented of his sins i mean i'm not judging his soul i, I don't know that i'm just talking about publicly but it's a good reminder for us to examine ourselves examine the things that we are doing and to repent of them because we too um, might have an untimely death. And um, whenever we go, we need to um, enter into the judgment um, with a clean conscience, having confessed our sins and having trust in Christ to forgive us. Um, you know, why die unrepentant? It's just, um, it makes no sense. So I think it's a good reminder for us to uh, repent. Um, let's see. Have I seen the papacy circular video? No. And I'm not going to watch it because I, I'm not interacting with people who aren't um, being held accountable for their public slander and detraction of people, uh, for their scandalous behavior publicly. I'm not going to go to them for theology. And even if you're saying, no, don't go to them for theology, go to, to them to refute them. No, I don't think that they're worth engaging. Uh, people like that, no, they're not worth engaging. Um, I, you know, I'm not saying that, Hey, everybody that I engage is, is perfect or something. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm, but I am talking about people who are obstinate and publicly scandalous. Um, I think should be avoided. And, um, you know, I don't think we should entertain them. I don't think that I should give him a platform by even addressing, uh, his circularity claim, which is, uh, quite frankly, ridiculous, because um, I don't even think he's aware of the argument that I would make here to show it's not circular. Um, I'm quite certain he's not aware, because I've listened to his material in the past on this. So, unless he's come up with something new, and unless he's, um, you know, somehow gotten into my brain. And seeing my material that I would present, um, I don't think he's coming up with anything I haven't heard. And I know for a fact he hasn't heard my position on it. So, uh, but anyways, let's see what else we have. Um, 
Have you seen the Orthodox icon of the Pope attacking the ship of Orthodoxy along with other heretics? No, I have not. Please send that to me. I got to see that immediately. <laughs> I have not seen that. That's 100% new to me. Uh, does Pope Francis have any errors in his ordinary magisterium? That's a really, really good question. That's a really good question. You know, it seems like um, anytime you start digging for some cases like that there's always an exit there's always a way out to where that you know isn't necessarily the case i think that pope francis is careful not to say something that would absolutely um be traced back to him that would be an error I think that he's careful to avoid that or at least the people who are writing his material and stuff like that are careful uh to always have an out to always use something ambiguous enough to where it doesn't necessarily mean what we think it means that sounds erroneous right um not saying that there haven't been any i'm just saying that pretty much every case i've seen there's some wiggle room in there, uh, which I, I do think is problematic in and of itself. Um, well, I find your argument for the... Is that Mega Man, by the way? <laughs> it looks like Mega Man. I find your argument for the validity of Eastern Catholic Saints quite compelling. Does it come from other sources or, or is it your own? It, it's effectively my own, but I'm I'm making that argument from principles that i get from the other sources um i don't know if anybody else makes that same argument but i would say that you know if if one of the rites of the church is celebrating on its altars and venerating someone as a saint who is a heretic and is in hell i honestly do think that that would uh, be a strike against the holy of the creed, the one holy Catholic and apostolic, because holy pertains to the sacraments, their administration, and that, of course, includes the liturgy. And so if the church, or if Rome, I should say, has uh, implicitly accepted the veneration of that saint through approving their liturgical veneration, by their approving their rights and their prayer books um that that is an implicit accepting of them as a saint it's not of the same stature sure as a pope who declares somebody as a saint i'll grant you that but i would still say that i don't see how you could say they're not a saint because if you say they're not a saint they're not in heaven and they're in hell and they're a heretic uh <sighs> The church could approve a right of somebody who's venerated as a heretic? I mean, I don't know. That just really doesn't settle very well with me and would seem to invalidate the the church's claim to holy holiness um, and indefectibility. So I, I just I don't see it. It, it seems to be a, a defeater. Uh, so do I think Pope Francis is personally, privately, or materially a heretic? I, he's so hard to figure out. <laughs> I, I, I used to think, uh, you know, it was just clear cut and, and just the more and more I look into him, the harder it is to really just pin him down, which, which is a problem in and of itself. Right. But I, I, I wouldn't be able to say that he's a heretic, even materially. I, I don't know. Maybe <laughs> I don't know because anytime you try to go and say, okay, this seems like heresy, uh, there's, there's a way out of it where it wouldn't necessarily be understood in that way. And so until he comes and clarifies what he means, I don't know. And so um, I can't make that leap and say that he is, but um I do think that's problematic in and of itself. Will the next Pope be more in line with Orthodox Catholic teaching? No. Next question. Uh, 
There is also an icon of a Pope bowing before Mark of Ephesus. Is that right? <laughs> I got to see that. Please send that to me. I want to see it. <laughs> uh, so, no, it's not Mega Man. It's a character I made in high school for a game programming hobby. Well, that's awesome. That's pretty cool. Uh, it did look like Mega Man, though. You got to admit. <laughs> um, what else? Uh the Ark of Salvation icon features the Pope shooting arrows at the Orthodox. Let me find this. Ark of Salvation icon, Pope shooting arrows. Let's see. Did I find it here? Y'all let me know if this is it. Is this it right here? This one? I see some arrows. I see the church. I see what looks like a pope. I guess that is an arrow. I don't know if that's a javelin or... I don't know what he's holding. Hmm. It says icon of the Ark of Salvation. So, um, yeah. <laughs> what do I make of that? Rhetoric, right? That, that's what I make of that. Uh, it, couldn't we do the same thing? I mean, couldn't, couldn't we make an icon of the church with a pope in the boat and then a bunch of Orthodox bishops shooting arrows at the boat and at each other? Because they're doing both, right? Uh, could, couldn't we also be polemical and, and obnoxious like that? I think so. Um, <clears throat> I think it's childish. I think that we, we could do the same. And at the end of the day, what does that really prove? Um, it, it doesn't really prove anything, right? So um, I think it's best that we stick to arguments than that kind of stuff. Um, we can judge the merits of one's theology based on beard length alone, right? Yeah, but isn't that an actual orthodox apologetic historically? Those filioquists and azimists, they shave their beards, they're priests, they're beardless. The beard argument, y'all know that, right? That was actually debated. <clears throat> that was used to slander uh, the Latins because Latin priests shaved their beards, which I think is not the best thing, <laughs> but I'm not going to turn it into a uh, way to determine who's part of the true church. Uh, so... <laughs> Am I going to do a show on James Martin? Maybe. I don't know. I mean, somebody like James Martin is so conspicuously heretical and so conspicuously determined to undermine the church that it's kind of, why even do a show? I mean, we all know the guy's wrong, right? I like focusing a little bit more on things that require nuance and no nuance is needed for Father James Martin. <laughs> what would we do? <laughs> Um, let's see. <laughs> well, I should make an alternate account where I'm super political and use a voice changer. Yeah, sounds like somebody we know, right? <laughs> no, I for one actually put my name out there. It's right here on the screen. You, um, you, you know who I am. You see what I look like. You know my name. I even say where I live. Um, I'm not hiding, right? Um, whereas some of these other people are hiding, and I really wonder what is it they're trying to hide uh, to reveal their i to uh, prevent their identity from being disclosed to the point that you actually have to have somebody else read your articles for you. As I hear, that's the case because I don't really listen to their material, but I hear that's the case or that a robot reads your stuff. Um, I wonder what, 
what is it that if I did a Google search on your name, if I knew your name, what would I find on you? What is it you're trying to hide if I knew what your identity was? Yeah, think about that. Let let the implications of what I'm saying uh, sink in there. And then ask yourself, are you really going to try to get theology from somebody like that? And how reliable would they be? And then if they spend time slandering people um, and misinterpreting people, how reliable would they be in interpreting the church fathers? Ask those kinds of questions. Uh, let's see. So some people are afraid of putting their names out there because they're afraid of losing their job. Um, yeah, yeah, okay, I understand that. But if they're afraid of losing their job, don't get online and start slandering people, right? You see what I'm saying? Um, it, it's one thing of I'm afraid of losing my job, which my question is how, how, but okay, let's just say there's a legitimate concern there of you losing your job. Eh, so, okay, you're going to go anonymous. That's fine. But slandering people while doing it anonymously, that's not being afraid of losing your job, right? That's you not wanting to be held accountable for what you say. And see, people like that can slander people, and they can also say things that are false. Not only are they not accountable, but they can press the reset button, come out with a new identity, and now they have a new reputation. They don't have the reputation of, oh, that's that guy who said this over here that's completely false. And we've been, you know, everybody has shown that that guy's unreliable and doesn't know what he's talking about. So dismiss him. No, they just press a reset button, uh, create a new uh, avatar and come up with a new name. And now there's somebody else. New reputation. Are you really going to get your theology from somebody like that? Uh, well... Let's see what else we have. I'm looking in the chat, y'all. If I see received any death threats, not that I can recall from people online. <laughs> I've had many death threats in person, uh, but I'm trying to think, have I had death threats online? I don't think I have. Not that I recall. Not that I can recall. No. And I wouldn't take that seriously. Mm. Um, <laughs> I love this one. Those icons are insulting, but aesthetically pleasing. They were aesthetically pleasing, weren't they? I like the way it looked. It looks cool. I liked that icon, but it, it was definitely obnoxious. <laughs> was the purpose of uh, false decretals if it wasn't to prop up papal claims. Yeah, I'm sure there was some, an element of truth there, right? But at the same time, um, was it really needed? I would say no. It wasn't really needed. There was plenty of authentic material that could have been used, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that everyone had access to that material at the time. Mm, let's see what else. Um, I posted a response to your discussion on Pope St. John Paul II and the ordinary magisterium with sources that I think will help settle the question. Yeah, I mean, let just tell me quickly a summary of it. I don't know when I'll have the time to read it, so maybe just post a real quick summary, um, if you can, in, in the chat, if that's possible. I know some things can't be summarized really quickly, so, um... I'm looking for others in the chat here. And, and by the way, just so everybody will know what we're talking about there, we're talking about um, the show that I did on John Paul II um, and whether or not he was teaching that the Pope is infallible in all things that he teaches, whether extraordinary, ex cathedra, or just regular, ordinary papal magisterium. Um, so... Oh, this is a good question. So how did I first meet Eric, Elijah, and William? Well, um, Eric, he and I had been talking for years, maybe six, seven years. I don't remember exact the year, but a long time. Um, I think he had once reached out to me 
on Messenger asking me questions. And that was kind of how we met. Uh, I think he had maybe read some of the material that I wrote uh, and reached out and asked some questions. And we just started talking from there. And we eventually just started talking almost every day, just bouncing ideas back and forth uh, off of each other, talking about papacy and orthodoxy and stuff like that. Uh, and then Elijah, Elijah was subbing for Eric one day, uh, on a show. I think it was the Fatima round table that we had, uh, and Eric couldn't make it. So he brought, uh, Elijah on. And so, uh, after that, we had Elijah on again to talk about ecumenical councils. And then, mm, I don't know how, how it happened, but after that, we ended up, um, creating a group chat where all of us were in it and Elijah was in it and just kind of got to know Elijah more. And then William, I've known about William for back when I was Protestant, but uh, I reached out to him and got him to come on the show and interviewed him on, I want to say, was it purgatory or something like that? I interviewed him on something with the church fathers and um, I thought, you know what, we I need to get him to come on the show and debate somebody because I really want to host more debates. And I did that, and we just kind of developed a uh, a friendship af after that. So that's kind of how I met him. Um, <laughs> he specifically states in 1988 that there is a non-infallible element to the ordinary authentic magisterium. Yeah, I I'm going to need to check it. If you can maybe email me the link to the article, michael at reasonintheology.com or reasonintheology at gmail.com, either one of them just email me a link to it so i can check it out i'll read it um i think that would be interesting although again in the article itself not article the general audience itself he notes ex cathedra only right so there's that language that he gives there as well seeming to indicate that there could be errors but then there's that other language that seems to indicate that there can be papal errors so uh, or there might not be papal heirs that even ordinary magisterium is protected. So it's just kind of odd uh, in the way it's phrased. Uh, so yeah, send it to me. I'll, I'll check it out. Um, yeah, so on usury, a uh, whole lot that can be said there, but basically effectively with usury um the church fathers early on seem to be opposed to any form of interest and then uh as time progressed um some interest was allowed that wasn't considered usurious um so basically the conception went from well usury has always been wrong but the concept of what constitutes usury slightly changed so that's kind of that's kind of uh, a quick answer, but a whole lot more can be said. Uh, what else do we have? Uh, need more on atheism? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. I'm definitely uh, willing to do more. Um, there's a time there where we had a whole streak of them, but... Uh, I think it was after T jump that I just kind of, eh. <laughs> I'm going to revisit atheism later. I can't deal with these people right now. They're just so ridiculous. Um, but, you know, there are some good ones out there that aren't just ridiculous, right? I mean, Thomas, our contributor, I, I respect him. I don't agree with him, but I, I, I can dialogue with him, right? So if you can show me more people like that that I can have a discussion with, it's charitable. Sure, I'm willing to do that. Uh, will I be watching the debate on Frad show? Yeah, yeah, I'll definitely check it out. Uh, why doesn't James White come on the show? Ask him. I've been asking him that question too. I've been sending him messages. Um, I mean, I've probably contacted him three or four times throughout two years, right? Uh, I've probably sent about three or four messages. And I did a video response to him. Uh, because he briefly responded to an article that I wrote on the dividing line, and it was uh, wasn't very good. And so I, I responded, and you know, invited him on again, and sent him the link, and never hear from him. You know, 
Don't know why he won't come on. I guess, you know, us peasants here. <laughs> I don't know. If we're not important enough. I, I, I don't know. I don't get it. Um, check out the comment section. Okay, I'll do that. But if you can, to just remind me. Uh, maybe just email me the link if you don't mind. Um, let's see. Do I consider any conspiracy theories historically and at present believable? <laughs> uh, I'm not big into conspiracy theories at all. Not not that there couldn't be some that are true. It's just that they're intangible and a lot of conjecture is assumed. And um, I, I like facts. It's I don't like speculating a whole lot. Um, but I, I do find the one on the third secret very interesting. Uh, I find that one definitely interesting to have a degree in philosophy. Well, my, my master's is um, in theology specifically and my undergrad is um, in general studies. So um, cause they didn't have religion, they didn't have history and they didn't have a philosophy degree. So that was literally the closest thing that I could do to get as many philosophy classes and religion classes as possible. They didn't have a degree, but they did have some religion classes and philosophy classes and history classes. So that was the best way I could do all of those. Um, although I was about three classes away from getting a second bachelor's in history, but I, I had to go ahead and take my one degree and couldn't finish the other because my, my daughter was born and I needed a job. So, <laughs> um, yeah, but no, back to your question, I've had a lot of classes in my degrees on philosophy, but none specifically in philosophy. Uh, I wouldn't be opposed to later on when I'm done with the doctorate getting one in philosophy. Um, I know this isn't going to be my only doctorate. It will, it will be my first doctorate, but I, I will get another doctorate afterwards. Probably in philosophy. Um, maybe in something else. We'll see. I like learning. Uh, I'll probably just continue to learn. You know, there will probably never be a time in which I'm not learning and studying and, and working on something. But um, yeah, uh, we'll, we'll see on getting a degree on it. Uh, but yeah, did have a whole lot of classes on it in undergrad and also um, with a master's. So. Mm, Okay, what else? My favorite example of typology. Uh, I don't know exactly what you mean by example. Um, but I think if I understand what you mean, the temple, the Old Testament temple, full of typology. And read St. Bede's commentary on the temple. Uh, awesome stuff or his commentary on Ezra and Nehemiah, which involves the temple, but he has one explicitly on the tabernacle and one explicitly on the temple. The one on the temple is my favorite. Mm. Yeah. My opinion on the creation evolution thing. I haven't formulated any final conclusions there. So I'm, I'm open to considering theistic evolution. I'm open to considering just a pure creationist perspective that is non-evolutionary. Um, I'm opening to hear the, the different sides. Um, looking more here. Not big time enough for, uh, for Dr. Uh, White. Yeah. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I've never received a, no, I won't come on your show directly. Um, he did tell someone else and word got back to me that no he's not going to be coming on but that's second or third hand that i got that information he's never even acknowledged any of my messages i've messaged him and i was rich and i'm not saying like i've you know stalked these people and sent them just a ton of messages that, that's not what i'm saying over the course of a couple of years I've, I've probably reached out three or four times so um what else? Opinion on Lefebvre. Yeah. You know, when you read his um, books and when you read his letters, you know, um, I think he meant well. I think he intended well. I don't I don't think that he was meaning to be 
uh, contentious. I don't think that he was meaning to be disobedient. I don't, you know, I, I don't, I don't think he had bad will. Um, did he make the right decision? I, I, I just don't think he made the right decision with the ordinations. I don't think that was the right decision. Um, but I understand why he made it. And, uh, you know, I'm not saying he's just this bad person. I, I don't agree with it, but I get where he was coming from. You know, and I don't think he had evil intentions behind it. Um, yeah, re read some of Bonaventure. Yeah, yeah, I have the Breviloquium that I got the other day, and I need to read through it. Although I, I read a while back when I was doing my master's, his journey to the mind of God or, or something like that. It was really good. I loved it. I was so captivated by that book. It was just, it, it was amazing. I need to go back and reread it. And I almost never reread a book because I always feel like I have so many other books that I need to read. Uh, so I, I rarely reread something, but I, I would actually go back and reread it because it was, uh, it was really good. I loved it. <clears throat> uh, let's see what else. Yeah, could I do more um, on Jewish people? Yeah. I, I would love to. If you can maybe send me some good names to have on that show, we can do that. Do I intend the ordinary at Parish? Well, no, um, because the ordinary here failed, right? So technically, I'm part of the ordinary at but we never the parish it never got off the ground the group that was forming the, the parish uh it never got off the ground so i was i'm technically a member but you, you got to go to the latin rite to get the sacraments uh, not that the ordinary it's not part of the latin rite but you you know what i mean you got to go to um the novus ordo or a latin mass or something like that uh, there's no ordinary at parish here. Um, but yeah, ordinary is good. So definitely check them out. I like your name based Byzantine <laughs> and I, and I like the icon too, by the way, of St. Patrick there. Um, uh, let's see what else we have. Um, any advice on how to get the most out of Denzinger? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a that's a good question. Um, and, and are you talking about the most out of it just reading Denzinger by himself? Um, if you're just reading Denzinger by himself, you, you'll get a lot out of him. Don't get me wrong. I am the kind that literally started reading Denzinger cover to cover. Um, you'll, you'll get some out of it, but I think it's better to read it coupled with other things like... Um, Let's say um, Ott, you know, because he's, he's going to cite Denzinger and others. And so maybe read a manual or something in theology that is going to give you locations to go and read Denzinger. But if you're just wanting to really just read the whole thing, I would just say read cover to cover. Um, but that's not going to be an easy read. I'll tell you that right now, because it's not really written in a way that you're going to just read it cover to cover. That's not how it was written. Try to couple it with odd. Uh, any any commentaries on the Deuterocanonicals? Again, Bede has some good stuff on the Deuterocanonicals, so check check Bede out. Um, now, the Glossa Ornaria has commentary on the Deuterocanonicals, but it's not, of course, in English. So uh, it's mostly in, in uh, it's all in Latin. Um, but you know, some of it is translated, so you can you can get access to feeds commentaries uh, but of course you can also get the uh, volume up here by the uh, ancient christian commentary on scripture series and get the one on the apocrypha and it will give you select uh commentary on uh on apocryphal books it's called apocrypha because it's written by a protestant right so they're not going to call it Deuterocanonicals. It's not actually written by, it's edited by a Protestant, although there were Catholics and I think even Orthodox who contributed to it. Uh, but they label it the Apocrypha, even though technically it's Deuterocanonicals. So 
Uh, have I watched Sopranos? I've never seen The Sopranos. I've heard of it, never seen it. Is it permissible to reject divine simplicity and be a Catholic? No, it's not. Uh, now, what do you mean by simplicity? Might be some wiggle room there, but if we're just strictly speaking about divine simplicity, no. Um, that's defined by Lateran 4. Would I ever move from Louisiana? Yeah, one day. One day. I will. Um, what else we have here? I'm looking. Favorite from the uh, theologian from the 18th century? Well, that's a good question. So from the 1700s. Mm, offhand, not coming up with any names. Uh, you got me on that one. I'd have to go and uh, look at some dates again. Uh, looking at uh, another one here. What book set volume commentary do you recommend? Yeah, honestly, I am very much not content with uh, most of what I read as far as commentary. Um, I do like the Ignatius uh, study Bible and it has select volumes on the Old Testament right now because it's not compiled into one. I do like the Ignatius study Bible. I think it's good. I like it. Um, but I'm, I'm just not happy with most commentaries all around because I like commentary that is going to really engage the church fathers, and that is hard to find. It's very hard to find. Um, but as I mentioned the other day, if you go and look at the original Dewey Reims, it's full of commentary on the church fathers. So, can I briefly explain the essence and energies debate and absolute divine simplicity? I could. <laughs> But it's not going to be brief. So I'd say go and watch all of the videos that we've done on this. I mean, the, if you want me to give you just a brief explanation here, you know, the absolute divine simplicity position is characterized as um, the virtual distinction of Thomas Aquinas so that there's really no difference between the uh, activity of God and his essence uh, well, not so much activity. Let me rephrase there because some might nitpick with that because activities could be extra. Um, there's no distinction between, for example, God's wisdom and God's essence, that this is all only a virtual. In other words, the distinction is pretty much in your mind. It's not in God himself. Uh, whereas the essence and energies distinction is saying that there's an actual distinction in God himself between his knowledge, his wisdom, his goodness, his mercy, and God's uh, essence. So that's effectively, in a quick nutshell, the, um, the debate. But so much more can be said there. So just go and watch the videos that we've done. Uh, do you think it should be a church discipline for young men to spend a few months in seminary? Uh, all young men? I don't know about that one. Uh, I'm not saying it's bad, but I I don't know if that would be absolutely necessary to be able to discern the vocation to uh, the priesthood, I, I guess is what you're getting at. Unless you're just saying, do I think it's necessary to give that catechetical formation to all young men? In which case, I'm going to say, yeah, but you don't have to do that in a seminary. Um, I'll do a few more. Do I have Italian ancestry? I do. I do. My uh, great-grandmother came to America from Italy. Didn't speak a lick of English. Um, what else? So I'm Orthodox. However, I feel a strong pull back to Rome. My theological issues still aren't solved, but I may just ignore that and revert as that impious to do. Um, hard to really answer that without asking other questions. In some cases, yes. In some cases, no. 
I'd have to find out more, more information. Um, I'll say this though, just kind of in general, you're not going to solve all of your questions, right? Some, some questions are going to be ongoing and, and you'll just be learning and trying to work through your whole life. So you, you can't put something like that on hold for all of your questions. What you need to do is solve the questions that will give you a moral certitude that the decision that you're making is right. And what I mean by that is you might not know for sure that all things have been settled in your mind right now uh, before making a decision, but you can at least know that, but this that I have learned gives me enough certitude that I'm making the right decision. You want to get to that point. And how will you know when it comes to the issue between orthodoxy and Catholicism? Um, what What is that line? The papacy. The papacy is where it's at. Not the filioque, not the essence and energies. Those are important, but those aren't the ultimate thing that is going to really give you moral certitude here. The moral certainty will come from is it in fact the case that the papacy is a divine institution by, from Christ, instituted by Christ? If the answer is yes, you have to become Catholic. You can work through the rest later. If the answer is no, you should not become Catholic, and you can work through the rest later. You see? It all boils down to that. You can't say it boils down to the filioque or essence and energies because all of those are ultimately contingent on the papacy. So work through that issue, and then you'll have enough certainty to know where you're going. I would say if you haven't really worked through that and you don't have a, a decent um, opinion formulated on that yet, I wouldn't make a decision yet. I would work through that first. All right. I'm looking. So what is the mechanism of action behind papal infallibility? In other words, how does it work if it's not an act of revelation? Is it by divine providence error is prevented? It's an assistance is what we would call it, an assistance. It's not an inspiration, right? It's just an, insist, a, 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 an assistance that prevents error. That doesn't mean that the papal definition will be the best way in which it should be expressed, right? That would be inspiration. No, uh, it might not be expressed very well. There might be some need to express it better in another age. Um, but the proposition is still going to remain the same, right? The proposition can't change according to Vatican I. Um, but we could uh revise the language used to make the proposition because we recognize that that is not what is protected <laughs> well let, let me rephrase that's not what is really guided by the holy spirit it is protected in other words it's going to be protected from being erroneous uh but that's effectively what it is it's, it's just a protection uh, what is my favorite Eastern Catholic prayer book? That's a good question. I have it right over there. <laughs> I wish I could grab it. Give me one second, y'all. I'm going to pause my camera and my audio for maybe five seconds. I'll be right back and I will grab it, show it to y'all. All right, I'm back here. All right, here it is. -na 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 -na. Cue the Zelda music. You know, whenever you open the treasure box, it goes. -na 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 -na. You got the Eastern Catholic prayer book. Uh, let us pray to the Lord, Volume One, Primer of the Daily Office. It's really good stuff published by Eastern Catholic Publications. A primer of the daily office according to the Byzantine tradition. This is my favorite. I love it. Nice and compact, too. So uh, I added the little 
dividers here, but um, yeah, I really, I really like it. So y'all should get it. Um, I heard of the neo catechumenical or catechumenal way, uh, but I have not looked into it, so I can't really comment on it. Uh, some of y'all are saying you <laughs> you got 20 rupees. <laughs> No, then this one was a little bit more than 20 rupees. Uh, to my re recollection, this was about 50 or 60 rupees <laughs> with, with, with shipping and tax and all that. So, <laughs> uh, which book uh, would you suggest I read except for Phaser? Um, on what, on what specifically? Um, so. Yeah, you'll have to give me more there. Uh, what I find most beautiful about Catholicism that is unique to it, that is able to take all of the rites of the church, it's able to take these different traditions, and I'm using them in a lower T sense, and incorporate them into one, uh, one body. I like that. Um, Michael has Italian genetics. Yes, I do. And also uh, Viking genetics too. <laughs> I uh, I did one of those deals where you can look up your um, it, it it traces your genes. Uh, Ancestry.com, I think, is what it was. I did that uh, to try to find out what my roots are. Uh, and uh, I'm a mutt, basically. <laughs> England, Ireland, uh, Northern Europe scandinavia that area so it's like I, I got a little bit of everything in me <laughs> uh, yeah um what else we have here i'm looking patrick you're a viking too that's awesome go go and watch the show vikings by the way if you haven't already uh you have to do it <laughs> <laughs> uh here's called the modernism the source where i got john the eighth calls the filioque way heresy you know i went back and uh looked at it and i'm quite certain that what you're referring to was an actual forgery um there are no to my knowledge documents that are authentic there where john the eighth calls the filioque heresy uh there is a forgery floating around out there however that has him saying that so that's probably what you're thinking of um what else do we have uh yeah, I think here's your quote, but rather we must act with wisdom and moderation, urging them little by little to give up that blasphemy. Therefore, those who claim that we share this opinion are not correct. Yeah, I believe that one was the forgery. I'll go and double check that quote and, and let you know in the comment section. But I did verify that there was a forgery uh, on that one, but nothing authentic. Um, so if you can get me something authentic, that would be good. Um so and here's your citation okay i'll have to double check and see if that is the forgery so i'll have to do that after the show um any good sources on essence and energies yeah um <laughs> a lot and uh for what in favor or against uh start with mark spencer then go to toddlebin and then read palamas himself um is the eo claim of forgery a bunk claim claim on what i mean because there are some forgeries in the west but there's forgeries in the east too so i mean um on what specifically would be the question um let me do maybe one more and uh we'll call it quits i'm looking Okay, well, I don't see any more, so we'll go ahead and uh, leave it there. I appreciate y'all's participation. Um, well, hold on, here's one. Would you consider making a blog like videos? I, I don't know if I understand the question. We do have a blog, though, reasonandtheology.com, where we have articles on occasion. It's just 
I don't do the articles as much as I do the videos, but reason of theology.com. We have, we have some uh, articles on there as well. Anyways, again, thank y'all for watching. I really appreciate your uh, interaction there. It always makes it fun. Uh, so, you know, y'all keep, uh, keep watching, pay attention uh, for upcoming shows and definitely continue to chime in with your questions and your comments. I always enjoy it till next time. God bless everybody.